life? How are things? Yay! How are you? How's it going? Just make sure this is working. Okay, looks like it's working. But yeah, I hope things are well. Uh, you all right? I hope all right, all right. Or all right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing quite well. Um, yeah, it's a lot, lot of things this week. And I have one more thing that I have to just kind of get, get through tomorrow before I can start the weekend. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to being done with that. But um, we get to do some spoopins. So that's good, I guess. I hope. <gasps> uh. So, yes, if it's more of a... All right, all right. I hope that it is, it gets better. You're perfectly fine, no worries. Okay, okay, I hope so. Sounds good. <laughs> well, um, so I just have this, so, so this, is, this is what we're doing tonight. Um, the, the past three weeks for Spooptober, we were reading the Phantasmagoriana Tales of the Dead, which is what Lord Byron, um, Percy and Mary Shelley, and other people were reading when they did the the contest that resulted in Frankenstein, as well as these other shorter things that we're going to read tonight. Frankenstein is just too long. So we were reading the inspiration for what we're reading tonight. And I just put the vampire up there because um, the other two, one is a poem and the other is a, a fragment of a novel. It's actually kind of what it's called, um, which inspired the vampire. So... So yeah, so the first one we'll go we'll go with that. Um, I have no I I forgot how to do this. Hang on. Um, um, <laughs> that and um, where is it? That one. Ah, boop and a boop and oh, that's not. Oh, I guess it is. It comes up like that, but it does end up going like. And now why aren't you working? I had cheese pasta. Okay. So yeah. So it's like it's like that. It's very short. So this is the poem. So it was. So what ha what ended up happening was apparently I'm not going to get into the whole story because that that's a trip. So Lord Byron ended up writing a fragment of a novel or just a fragment um about uh vampire stories that he um, heard on his travelings, and so that is after this, and then that inspired The Vampire, which was written by John Polidori, who was Lord Byron's personal physician, I guess, and The Vampire, with a Y, um, was sort of, like, the first, like, credited with being the first, like, it, it kind of started inspiring how we kind of view vampires today. I guess I can shut this off now. There. Um, and then, so this first one, though, is what Lord Byron actually ended up writing, and it was just a poem. So they're all kind of ghost horror sort of things, um, trying to, uh, what's the word, one-up the stories that they were reading to uh, entertain themselves. So, first one, ooh, and to have orange sucker today because it is the final sucker day. So we're doing orange because Halloween, yay. <laughs> all right, so, so this is called Darkness by Lord Byron and all I can think of is Metallica, <laughs> one, uh, but we shall see. Darkness by Lord Byron. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air, morn came and went, and came, and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. 
happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them. Some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled, and others hurried to and fro, and fed their funeral piles with with fuel, and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky, the, pa the pall of a past world, and then again with curses cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth and howled. The wild birds shrieked, and terrified did flutter on the ground. So this is a historically significant text. Yes-ish? Yes, kind of. I mean, it depends on what you consider historically significant. But it was. This was written in the same, um, again, the same contest that resulted in Frankenstein. So, and it's Lord Byron. So that's, yeah, he's known. So, <laughs> so yeah. And they were, they're all ghost horror-y sort of stories. horror -y sort of stories. Make sure I enunciate that. So I figured, why not? And I'm liking it so far. It's interesting. Um, and oh, and terrified did flutter on the, the wild birds shrieked, terrified did flutter on the ground, and flapped their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous, and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude, hissing but stingless. They were slain for food, and war, which for a moment was no more, did glut himself again. A meal was bought with blood, and each sate sullenly apart, gorging himself in gloom. No love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death. Immediate and inglorious, and the pang of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meager by the meager were devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a course, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay, till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws, himself sought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress, he died. The crowd was famished by degrees, but two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies, sorry, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place, where had been heaped a mass of holy things for an unholy usage. They raked up, and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes and their feeble breath blew for a little life and made a flame which was a mockery then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter and beheld each other's aspects saw and shrieked and died even of their mutual hideousness they died unknowing who he was upon whose brow famine had written fiend the world was void the populous and the powerful was a lump seasonless, herbless, treeless, manless, lifeless, a lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. The rivers, lakes, and ocean all stood still, and, enough, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships, sailorless, lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal. As they dropped, they, sl they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. Interesting. I got very sad at the puppy part. <laughs> and that was... And that's something where... Okay, so again, they were trying to one-up or do better than the tales that they read, that they had been reading. So... Going at it from that angle, thinking about, okay, what went into writing this? Why, as an author, as a writer, would you consider this to be more horrific or to be the most horrific? And it, it does. It, it's not a, not a trope, but it's a, um, a common theme of end of the world, us no longer being there. What is the universe when we are not in it, we are that we're atoms within an uncaring universe or what, however the line goes or what 
whatever line there is. I'm sure there's multiple. Um, but yeah, kind of pondering on that and making it cold, making it dark. Um, and then, so yeah, so that was kind of, on one hand, again, it's, it's one of those things where it's overdone, but the thing is, I have this, I have this, not gripe, but the same opinion on certain classic horror movies. Like I watched the, um, like the shining and, um, psycho. And the thing is, is they didn't hit me as much as they probably would have had I not already heard all of the things that they had, all of the horrific things that they had in them. So they did so well at that point because they were new and fresh and then everything else copied them. And then if you hear all the things from the copies, the original kind of hits less sort of thing is, yeah. So that's what I was kind of going into here where, if it is, if that's, that's what, what somebody said as I was doing the research for it is it's kind of a um, end of the world sort of thing. And it's like, okay, that's been done over and over. But yeah, with that historically significant sort of thing, at what point, how much before this or during around in this time was this, did this come up? Um, and then to have that cosmic ending with this part, I did, I really did like is a, a not quite the right word, but the part where it's even dogs assail their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a corpse, and I assume that means corpse, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws. Himself sought out no food, but with a piteous perpetual moan and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress, he died. Like, it's, it's such an interesting part to put in there, because it is, it is so broad and sweeping and it's all over the world and it's, it's everyone. Everyone is suffering. Everything is suffering. And it does, it goes all the way, not just the world, but then it's cosmic. But just to have this little piece in there, that's like, it's, it's not, it's almost like, almost like weirdly hopeful because it's not it's like the world isn't all darkness and chaos and uncaring there and 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 even in the other thing it said there was no more love and again it depends on how you think whether animals can feel love and what your definition of love is or whatever like it's just yeah so there was no love left but then putting that in there so i don't know i thought i did i th It is. It's it's a it's a really good text, um, but I think that that piece, having that piece in there, really kind of like kind of gave it that little extra something, I guess. At least at least that's 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 how I felt about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, definitely very good. Um, and, and again, I feel weird saying this stuff because it's like, I am critiquing, a, I don't know, master, but like, his a very classic, known, <laughs> well-established writer. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm just saying these are these are opinions. These are all just opinions by me. I have no critiquiness of people who can write better than I can. But yeah. It was very, very um, descriptive, and the imagery's imagery really, really comes through. <sighs> so yeah, and it, it um, I didn't really. I think this was more of a can you say, prose poem. Pang men flesh devoured one kept bay dead devoured dead. I'm not sure. I didn't really get a rhyme scheme from it, so I'm assuming it's more prose. Huh. So yeah, so that was Lord Byron's um, offering for the um, for the contest. And then now we shall do, nope, not that one, not that one, not yet. We have to do the inspiration first. So this one was also by, oops, Lord Byron. 
Gosh darn it. Um, I'm not sure about the introduction. I don't think I... Um, yeah, no, I don't think so. Oh no, you missed it all. You were doing a crossword. Oh no. <laughs> Well, it was it was it, it was just a poem. It was just kind of to to pat to pad the uh, to pad the timing because I don't think this, these are gonna take very long. <laughs> so it was a good one. It's Darkness by Lord Byron. If you wanted to read it, how's the crossword going? Do you need any help? I like crosswords myself, so I understand. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh. Uh, oh, it's in Hebrew, so I can help you none. Yeah, you doubt I can help. Nope, can't do nothing. Not a bit. Sorry to be of non-assistance, <laughs> but good luck with it. I hope I hope you can finish it. I'm sure you will be able to finish it, but yeah, kind of looking forward to hearing that you did finish it. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, so this next one is also by Lord Byron. Fragment of a novel, 1819, by Lord Byron. And again, it is. it was written by him um, about vampire stories he had heard on his travels, and it was discarded, and his personal physician, John Polidori, who was also at that gathering, took that fragment and wrote his own novel, which was The Vampire, which we will read after this. So we're just kind of seeing how like things transitioned and the inspiration of and all that. So I guess that's kind of the theme of this year and oh no I have to can I oh I can oh yay perfect I thought I was gonna be covering stuff up you like crosswords teaches you a lot of strange little words right and I feel like there have there have been um if you do enough of them and like within the same I would say like publication you end up getting repeat thing like repeat words or even phrases and uh they they stick with you a lot better then. Because there is. I want to... Uh, Ode to a Grecian Urn. <laughs> I knew of that poem because I was doing crosswords at the time. And like every week or... It was frequently used in the crosswords. So it, it kind of stuck. So I do. I, I actually... I absolutely appreciate that. And that's awesome. Did, did you learn one yet for this one? And what is it? Or what's one that you particularly remember? Oh, yeah. So this was in the 1800s, early 1800s. Um, Frankenstein was published in 1818. It started as a short story. And then um, Percy, her husband, um, Mary Shelley's husband, encouraged her to to keep writing it. And, then, and she did. She wrote that thing and 1818 was when it first came out and then I guess there was another version that she updated some stuff and that came out in 1831. For instance, you discovered that ancient Hebrew had a word for a Roman gladiator. Ludar from Latin ludo to play, hence player. Interesting. I love that. Oh, that's so cool. And I do, I love how yours is like, it's that, that, that language origins and stuff. Like, so it is, it's got like the Latin and then, I, so you are, yours, your, um, your native language is Hebrew. So for me, that's a different language for you. That's not, but, um, yeah, the, uh, having those, those linguistic connections. I love those because again, with the inspiration stuff finding all of those connections, you're a lot better able to like understand things as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Thank you for, thank you for uh, telling me that one. And so to play, because, oh God, this is going to be a terrible, very dumb question. Gladiators, that was violent. <laughs> Yet it's called a player. Interesting. To each their own, I guess. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So this is June 17, 1810. 
I think... So he's writing this from the point of view of the main character, so it's not from him, as far as I'm aware. So in the year 17, having, from, having for some time determined on a journey through countries not hitherto much frequented by travelers, I set out, accompanied by a friend, whom I shall designate by the name of Augustus Darvel. So maybe this is from his point of view. I guess I'm not. I'm not actually sure if Augustus Darvel is um, his is fictional or not. Well, 2,000 years ago, it was like watching a football match. Right, but but it does. It does. It has a different context nowadays. <laughs> so yeah, I do. It is. It's it's so interesting how those things change in the in language, <laughs> and that's why it ticks me off so much with the like the texting, um, uh the shortening of words and stuff because there's absolutely no way that you could trace back the origins of the language unless you knew like what words they were like yeah I don't know if that makes sense I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly but, but yeah so like you can you can see where where that came in why that word was what it was but say like like ASAP there's no there's no trail that you can take from and be like, oh, yes, that is what that word means. Alas. <laughs> Mi mini complaint. Uh, okay, sorry. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if Augustus Darville is fictional or not, so we shall see. He was a few years my elder and a man of considerable fortune and ancient family advantages which an extensive capacity prevented him alike from undervaluing or overrating some peculiar circumstances in his private in his private history had rendered him to me an object of attention of interest and even of regard which neither the reserve of his manners nor occasional indications of an inquietude at times nearly approaching to alienate alienation of mind could extinguish I was yet young in life, which I had begun early, but my intimacy with him was of a recent date. We had been educated at the same schools and university, but his progress through these had preceded mine, and he had been deeply initiated into what is called the world, while I was yet in my novitiate. Novitiate? Novitiate. That's a good word. Can I highlight it? I don't think so. Dang it. While thus engaged, I had heard much, much, both of his past and present life, and although in these accounts there were many and irreconcilable contradictions, I could still gather from the whole that he was a being of no common order, and one who, whatever pains he might take to avoid remark, would still be remarkable. I had cultivated his acquaintance subsequently and endeavored to obtain his friendship, but this last appeared to be unattainable. Whatever affections he might have possessed seemed now, so, seemed now some to have been extinguished and others to be cons concentered that his feelings were acute, I had sufficient opportunities of observing, for although he could control, he could not altogether disguise them. Still, he had a power of giving to one passion the appearance of another in such a manner that it was difficult to define the nature of what was working within him, and the expressions of his features would vary so rapidly, though slightly, that it was useless to trace them to their sources. It was evident that he was a prey to some cureless disquiet, but whether it arose from ambition, love, remorse, grief, from one or all of these, or merely from a morbid temperament akin to disease, I could not discover. Oh, this is kind of... Oh, shoot. There it is. Okay. Sorry. But whether it arose from ambition, love, remorse, grief, or from one or all of these, or merely from a morbid temperament akin to disease, I could not discover. There were circumstances alleged which might have justified the application to each of these causes, but, as I, have said as I have before said, these were so contradictory and contradicted that none could be fixed upon with accuracy. Where there is mystery, it is generally supposed that there must also be evil. I know not how this may be, but in him there certainly was the one, though I could not ascertain the extent of the other, and felt loth, as far as regarded himself, to believe in its existence. My advances were received with sufficient coldness, but I was young and not easily discouraged, and at length succeeded in obtaining, 
to a certain degree, that commonplace intercourse and moderate confidence of common and everyday concerns, created and cemented by similarity of pursuit and frequency of meeting, which is called intimacy or friendship, according to the ideas of him who uses those words to express them. Darvel had already traveled extensively, and to him I had applied for information with regard to the conduct of my intended journey. It was my secret wish that he might be prevailed, prevailed on to accompany me. It was also a probable hope, founded upon the shadowy restlessness which I had observed in him, and to which the animation which he appeared to feel on such subjects, and his apparent indifference to all by which he was more immediately surrounded, gave fresh strength. This wish I first hinted, and then expressed. His answer, though I had partly expected it, gave me all the pleasure of surprise. He consented, and after the requisite arrangements, we commenced our voyages. After journeying through various countries of the south of Europe, our attention was turned towards the east, according to our original destination, and it was in my progress through those regions that the incident occurred upon which will turn what I may have to relate. The Constitution of Darvel, which must from his appearance have been in early life more than usually robust, had been for some time gradually giving way, without the intervention of any apparent disease. He had neither cough nor hectic, yet he became duly more enfeebled. His habits were temperate, and he neither declined nor complained of fatigue, yet he was evidently wasting away. He became more and more silent and sleepless, and at length so seriously altered that my alarm grew proportionate to what I conceived to be his danger. Oh no, I, I can't bring this one over, so uh, I'll have to... Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I just don't want it to get cut off on the bottom there. We had determined on our arrival at Smyrna on an excursion to the ruins of Ephesus and Sardis, from which I endeavored to dissuade him in his present state of indisposition, but in vain. There appeared to be an oppression on his mind, and a solemnity in his manner, which ill corresponded with his eagerness to proceed on what I regarded as a mere party of pleasure, little suited to a valetudinarian. But I opposed him no longer, and in a few days we set off together, accompanied only by a serogy and a single jan janissary. <laughs> we had passed halfway towards the remains of Ephesus, leaving behind us the more fertile environs of Smyrna, and were entering upon that wild and tenantless track through the marshes and defiles which led to the few huts yet lingering over the broken columns of Diana. The roofless walls of expelled Christianity and the still more recent but complete desolation of abandoned mosques, when the sudden and rapid illness of my companion obliged us to halt at a Turkish cemetery, the turbaned tombstones of which were the sole indication that human life had ever been a sojourner in this wilderness. The only caravansera we had seen was left some hours behind us. Not a vestige of a town or even cottage was within sight or hope, and this city of the dead appeared to be the sole refuge for my unfortunate friend, who seemed on the verge of becoming the last of its inhabitants. Smyrna is modern-day Izmir in Turkey. Okay, it was part of the Ottoman Empire back then. Right. Okay. It's been a while. I'm terrible. I should brush up on my history, but I, I haven't. I haven't for a while. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> in this situation, I looked round for a place where he might most conveniently repose. Contrary to the usual aspect of Mahometan burial grounds, the cypresses were in, this, were in this few in number, and these thinly scattered over its extent. The tombstones were mostly fallen and worn with age. Upon one of the most considerable of these, and beneath one of the most spreading trees, Darvel supported himself in a half-reclining posture with great difficulty. He asked for water. I had some doubts of our being able to find any, and prepared to go in search of it with hesitating despondency but he desired me to remain, and turning to Suleiman, our Janizary, who stood by us smoking with great tranquility, he said, Suleiman Verbanasu, i.e., bring some water, and went on describing the spot where it was to be found with great minuteness, at a small well for camels, a few hundred yards to the right. The Janizary obeyed. I said to Darvel, How did you know this? He replied, From our situation, you must perceive that this place was once inhabited, and could not have been so without springs. I have also been here before. Okay. You have been here before? 
How come you... <laughs> I love how it's... Oh, from this, you can tell that there must be springs, and I've also been here. So that's, that's what it is. You have been here before. How came you never to mention this to me? And what could you be doing in a place where no one could remain a moment longer than they could help it? It was a Greek-majority city until the 1921 population exchange between Turkey and Greece. Interesting. Uh, was that also the name change as well? To this question, I received no answer. In the meantime, Suleiman returned with the water, leaving the Saragay, Saragi, and the horses at the fountain. The quenching of his thirst had the appearance of reviving him for a moment, and I concaved hopes of his being able to proceed, or at least to return, and I urged the attempt. He was silent and appeared to be collecting his spirits for an effort to speak. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Interesting. Ooh. I like that. Thank you. I really do. I really appreciate that. Uh, appeared to be collecting his spirits, his spirits, haha, for an effort to speak. He began. This is the end of my journey, and of my life. Okay. I came here to die, but I have a request to make a command. But I have a request to make, a command, for such my last words must be. You will observe it. Most certainly, but I have, be most certainly, but have better hopes. I have no hopes, nor wishes, but this conceal my death from every human being. I hope there will be no occasion that you will recover and peace. It must be so. Promise this. I do. Swear it by all that he here dictated an oath of great solemnity. There is no occasion for this. I will observe your request and to doubt me is it cannot be helped. You must swear. I took the oath. Uh, it appeared to relieve him. He removed a seal ring from his finger on which were some Arabic characters, and presented it to me. It's interesting that Byron chose that locale since he was famously enamored by Greek culture and found his death while assisting the Greeks in their war of independence. Interesting. Okay. So I, did, I didn't do a whole lot of research. So basically what I saw was that it was, he wrote this based on like his travels. So interesting. So it wasn't, it wasn't just like a passive traveling thing. He was like, he was, he was super into it. Interesting. Okay. <gasps> Got it. Okay. Thank you. I love that. Uh, he proceeded on the ninth day of the month at noon precisely. Wait, on the ninth day of the month at noon precisely. What month you please, but this must be the day. You must fling this ring into the salt springs, which run into the bay of Eleusis. The day after, at the same hour, you must repair to the ruins of the Temple of Ceres and wait one hour. Why? You will see. The ninth day of the month, you say. The ninth. No, he is still considered a hero in Greece to this day. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, that's super cool. Oh, interesting. Thank you. As I observed that the present, as I observed that the present was the ninth day of the month, his countenance changed and he paused. As he sate, evidently becoming more feeble, a stork with a snake in her beak perched upon a tombstone near us and, without devouring her prey, appeared to be steadfastly regarding us. I know not what impelled me to drive it away, but the attempt was useless. She made a few circles in the air and returned exactly to the same spot. Darvel pointed to it and smiled. He spoke, I know not whether to himself or to me, but the words were only, "'Tis well. What is well? What do you mean? No matter. You must bury me here this evening, and exactly where that bird is now perched. You know the rest of my injunctions. He then proceeded to give me several directions as to the manner in which his death might be best concealed. After these were finished, he exclaimed, "'You perceive that bird?' "'Certainly.' and the serpent writhing in her beak. Doubtless, there is nothing uncommon in it. It is her natural prey, but it is odd that she does not devour it. He smiled in a ghastly manner. Oh, I didn't bring it up there. He smiled in a ghastly manner and said faintly, It is not yet time. As he spoke, the stork flew away. My eyes followed it for a moment. It could hardly be longer than ten might be counted. 
I felt Larval's weight, as it were, increase upon my shoulder, and, turning to look upon his face, perceived that he was dead. I was shocked with the sudden certainty which could not be mistaken. His countenance in a few minutes became nearly black. I should have attributed so rapid a change to poison had I not been aware that he had no opportunity of receiving it unperceived. The day was declining, the body was rapidly altering, and nothing remained but to fulfill his request. With the aid of Suleiman's atagam and my own saber, we scooped a shallow grave upon the spot which Darval had indicated. The earth easily gave way, having already received some Mahometan tenant. We dug as deeply as the time permitted us, and throwing the dry earth upon all that remained of the singular being so lately departed, we cut a few sods of greener turf from the less withered soil around us and laid them upon his sepulcher. Between astonishment and grief, I was tearless. The end. Interesting. Okay. So. He apparently must have been a vampire. I guess, because it was apparently about... His, the tales were about vampires. And that's the thing. So, the next story apparently is credited with the more modern understandings of vampires. So... The fact that he died still, I would, I would be curious about like, like original, like that's not quite the right word, but like older, um, understandings or, um, characteristics of the vampires. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Eleusis is also a significant location, okie dokie. In ancient times, it was the center of the illusion mysteries, okay? I feel, I do, I have heard of this. Secret religious rites that were well known across the Hellenic world. Oh, maybe Byron was trying to evoke some of the mystique associated with that cult. Interesting. Are they at all connected with vampires? <laughs> or is, and that's, and that's the thing. Because like, Again, you say vampire, and in like a very cartoonish pop in the mind, and maybe it's just maybe it's just me, uh, pop in the mindish sort of thing. It's fangs and the slick back hair and the the little cape. <laughs> um, like like in Hotel Transylvania, I do not say blah blah blah. You do. You have. You eventually get that widespread imagery or understanding of a thing. Whereas it was, it was a little bit more fluid um, back when, I would say, just because it was more of a concept rather than an actual thing, if that makes sense. So, yeah, so I'm interested to see how this translated into the vampire. I wonder if that's significant at all. Vampire. Dun 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 dun. Oops, shoot, 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 shoot. No, but since they were secret throughout the years, people let their imaginations run wild, right? Maybe that vampire, being immortal, was present in ancient Greek. Okay. Maybe he took part in the cult. Oh. Well, and, th and that is, and that's the thing, is like one of the things of, uh, th well, the, the vampire is beheading or stake to the heart, wooden stake to the heart, uh, crucifix, ah. Um, but, yeah, but generally immortality, apart from those certain ways of going out so what is why why did yeah why did he right <laughs> got you um so yeah so why what was that was that was vampirism or like the, the the yeah the vampirism not associated with immortality then or like 
yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I am. I'm, I'm curious about the distinctions between, like, original vampire um, characteristics versus, like, what it eventually boiled, ended up boiling down to. So, yeah, interesting. I do. I like the, I like the, the, the cult, the cult bit. Cause, yeah, cause it does. It's like there's, there is, there's that thing, that absolutely real sort of thing versus, again, the sort of, um, theatrical understanding of, and Im theatrical imagery of, yeah, what we end up getting. <laughs> And the one, th the one thing is, is, as I was reading about this, I, I do hope it is still more of the horror <laughs> than um, potentially um, <laughs> other other things. I'm maybe slightly concerned, but like we're we're gonna try it. We're gonna see what happens with the vampire by John Polidori. We are. We're doing. We're doing good with time, and I'm hoping. Two, four, six, eight. Okay, we should be good. And this might. This might end up being a shorter one anyway, just because of the uh, content. And I have to get up in the morning tomorrow early, so that it, it might work out. So we'll see. We'll see how how long we go. <laughs> the vampire. It happened that in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leader of the leaders of the ton a nobleman who was more remarkable for his singularities than his rank. He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention that he might by a look quell it and throw fear into those breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Those who felt this sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the dead gray eye, which, fixing upon the object's face, did not seem to penetrate and at one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to violent excitement and now felt the weight of ennui, were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters after notoriety attempted to win his attentions and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster shewn in drawing rooms since her marriage, threw herself in his way and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice, though in vain. When she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unappalled impudence was, was baffled, and she left the field. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him, yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to the virtuous wife and innocent daughter, that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was that it even overcame the dread of his singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, he was as often among those females who form the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues as among those who sully it by their vices. About the same time, there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan left with an only sister in the possession of great wealth by parents who died while he was yet in childhood, left also to himself by guardians who thought it their duty merely to take care of his fortune while they relinquished the more important charge of his mind to the care of mercenary subalterns. He cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. He had hence that high romantic feeling of honor and candor, which daily ruined so many milliners' apprentices. He believed all to sympathize with virtue, and thought that vice was thrown in by providence merely for the picturesque effect of the scene, as we see in romances. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes which were as warm, 
but which were better adapted to the painter's eye by their irregular folds and various colored patches. He thought, in fine, that the dreams of poets were the realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon his entering into the gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving which should describe with least truth their languishing or romping favorites. The daughters, at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. This one seems to ascribe supernatural charms, charm to the vampire, a la Dracula. Yes, so this is actually what inspired Dracula. So this, this came before it, and that is, that's where that bit starts coming in, I think. So I think this is more where you start getting those modern day understandings of what a vampire is. Like when it had that little bit about he was invited into every home. So I, I, I think I'm, we shall see. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. Uh, attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered, not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life for any of the conjuries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes from which he had formed his study. Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. He watched him, and the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit assent to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact. Allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered its propensity to extravagant ideas, he soon formed this object into the hero of a romance and determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than the person before him. So it's like a proto-vampire. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Well, so yeah, so this is this is Lord Ruthven. And uh, yeah, from what I from what I read and from what I can remember, that's like the uh original. And then it was Dracula. So I, I am, I am curious to see like what what specific characteristics came from this, like the again, the uh, inviting into house and then like the uh sort of like y like you said, the charm and stuff. So, yeah. And so, like, and now I'm sad that we won't be able to actually read Dracula and see how that, can, how that compares and contrasts to this one. Alas, alas, that's, that's how it must be, uh, unfortunately. But, yeah. So, yeah, and I do, I like that. Determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than the person before him. And I wish I could highlight, but I can't, alas. He became acquainted with him, paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognized. He gradually learned that Lord Ruthven's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found, from the notes of preparation in Blank Street, that he was that he was about to travel. Desirous of gaining some information respecting this singular character, who, till now, had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians that it was time for him to prepare to perform the tour which for many generations has been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged, and not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies whenever scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subjects of pleasantry or of praise, according to the de degree of skill shewn in, in carrying them on. They consented, and Aubrey immediately mentioned and Aubrey, immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Ruthven, was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who, apparently, had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it, and in a few days they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto, Aubrey had had no opportunity of studying Lord Ruthven's character, and now he found that, though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the apparent motives to his conduct. His companion was profuse in his liberality. The idle, the vagabond, and the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous 
reduced to indigence by the misfortunes attendant even upon virtue that he bestowed his alms. These were sent from the door and hardly suppressed sneer, with hardly suppressed sneers, but when the profligate came to ask something, not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust, or to sink him still deeper in his iniquity, he was sent away with rich charity. This was, however, attributed by him to the greater importunity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indigent. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship, which was still more impressed upon his mind. All those upon whom it was bestowed inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were all, all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and the most abject misery. At Brussels and other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness, eagerness with which his companions sought for the centers of all fashionable vice. There he entered into all the spirit of the pharaoh table. He betted and always gambled with success, except where the known sharper was his, in where the known sharper was his antagonist, and then he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash, youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractedness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of the cat whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. Oh, shoot, where'd it go? In every town he left the formerly affluent youth torn from the circle he adorned, cursing in the solitude of a dungeon the fate that had drawn him within the reach of this fiend, whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute, hungry children, without a single farthing of his late immense wealth, wherewith to buy even sufficient, wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy their present craving. Yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost, to the ruiner of many, the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent. This might but be the result of a certain degree of knowledge, which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend, and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all, and did not tend to his own profit. But he delayed it, for each day he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruthven in his carriage, and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eye spoke less than his lip, and though Aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he obtained no greater gratification from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery, which to his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. They soon arrived at Rome, and Aubrey, for a time, lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess, whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. Whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had before enter entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him sufficient reason for the belief. His guardians insisted upon his immediately leaving his friend, and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious, for that the possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his licentious habits more dangerous to society. It had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character, but that, he that, but that he had required, to enhance his gratification, that his victim, the partner of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue, down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. In fine, that all those females whom he had sought, apparently on account of their virtue, had, since his departure, thrown even the mask aside, and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. <laughs> Interesting. Aubrey determined upon leaving one, whose character had not yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye. He resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether, purposing, in the meanwhile, to watch him more closely, and to let no slight circumstances pass by unnoticed. 
he entered into the same circle and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavoring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented. In Italy, it is seldom, it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society. He was therefore ob obliged to carry on his plans in secret, but Aubrey's eye followed him in all his windings and soon discovered that an assignation had been appointed, which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent, though thoughtless girl. Losing no time, he entered the apartment of Lord Ruthven and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time that he was aware of his, be of his being about to meet her that very night. Lord Ruthven answered that his intentions were such as he supposed all would have upon such an occasion, and upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her, merely laughed. Aubrey retired, and, immediately writing a note to say that from that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship in the remainder of their proposed tour, he ordered his servant to seek other apartments, and calling upon the mother of the lady, informed her of all he knew, not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. The assignation was prevented. Lord Ruthven next day merely sent his servant to notify his complete, his complete assent to a separation, but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by Aubrey's interposition. Uh-oh, I think he ticked them off. <laughs> having left Rome, Aubrey directed his steps toward Greece, and crossing the peninsula, soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that apparently, ashamed of chronicling the deeds of free men only before slaves, had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil of or many beneath the sheltering soil or many colored lichen. Under the same roof of, as himself existed a being so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed the model for a painter wishing wishing to portray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful in Ma, in Mahomet's paradise save that her eyes Mahomet's sorry paradise save that her eyes spoke too much mind for anyone to think she could belong to those who had no souls as she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mount, mountain side one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties for who would have exchanged her eye apparently the eye of animated nature for that sleepy, luxurious look of the, anim of the animal suited but to the taste of an epicure. The light step of Lamp Lampy often accompanied Aubrey in his search after antiquities, and often would the, the unconscious girl, engaged in the pursuit of a cashmere butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form, floating as it were upon the wind, to the eager gaze of him, who forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost effist, ta uh, effist tablet in the contemplation of her sylph-like figure. Often would her tresses falling, as she flitted around, exhibit in the sun's ray such delicately brilliant and swiftly fading hues. It's might, it, it might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary. It might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary, who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of a passage in Pausanias. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel, but none can appreciate? Interesting. It was innocence, youth, and beauty, unaf unaffected by crowded drawing rooms and stifling balls. Whilst he drew those remains of which he wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil in tracing the scenes of her native place. She would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colors of youthful memory the marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy, and then, turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind, would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse. It's pronounced Yanthi. It's a Greek name. Okay, sorry. Oh, it's an I. Got it. Sorry. Light step of Yanthi. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Yanthi. Appreciate it. Yanthi. <gasps> um, uh, marriage, pomp, infancy, uh, supernatural tales of her nurse. 
Her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of Aubrey, and often, as she told him the tale of the living vampire who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties, forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months, his blood would run cold whilst he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies, but Yanthe cited to him the names of old men who had at last detected one living among themselves, after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. And when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them, with grief and heartbreaking, to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of Lord Ruthven. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though at the same time he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Yanthe, her innocence so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance, won his heart, and while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits marrying an uneducated Greek girl, still he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her, and, forming a plan for some antiquarian research, he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained. But he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Yanthe was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank, infantile being he had first known. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she had no longer anyone with whom she could visit her favorite haunts, whilst her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time. She had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with several present, affirmed their existence, pale with horror at the very name. Soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged of him not to return at night, as he must necessarily pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain, after the day had closed upon any consideration. They described it as the resort of the vampires in their, in their nocturnal orgies, and denounced the most heavy evils as impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of their representations and tried to laugh them out of the idea, but when he saw them shudder and his at his and when, but when he saw them shudder at his daring thus to mock a superior infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, he was silent. Next morning, Aubrey set off upon his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host, and was concerned to find that his words, mocking the belief of those horrible fiends, had inspired them with such terror. When he was about to depart, Yanthe came to the side of his horse, and earnestly begged of him to return, ere night allowed the power of these beings to be put in action. He promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research that he did not perceive that daylight would soon end and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay. But it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets, night begins, and ere he had advanced far, the power of the storm was above. Its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick, heavy rain forced its way through the canopying foliage, whilst the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly his horse suddenly his horse took fright, and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found by the glare of lightning that he was in the neighborhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself up from the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunder, 
As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled, exultant mockery of a laugh continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled, but roused by the thunder which again rolled over his head, with a sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for, though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone whom he immediately seized. When a voice cried, again baffled, to which a loud laugh succeeded, and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled, but it was in vain. He was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, and kneeling upon his breast, had placed his hands upon his throat. When the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him, he instantly rose and, leaving his prey, rushed to rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches, as he broke through the wood, was no longer heard. The storm was now still, and Aubrey, incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered, the light of their torches fell upon the mud walls, and the thatch loaded on every, and the thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire, oh, oh, sorry. At the desire of Aubrey, they searched for her who had attracted him by her, by her cries. He was again left in darkness, but what was his horror when the light of the torches once more burst upon him? To perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless corpse. corpse. He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a vision arising from his disturbed imagination, but he again saw the same form when he unclosed them stretched by his side. There was no color upon her cheek, not even upon her lips, yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of teeth having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying, simultaneously struck with horror. A vampire, a vampire! A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions, now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was benumbed and seemed to shun reflection and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger of a particular construction which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties who had been engaged in the search of her whom a mother missed, whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries, as they approached the city, forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they ascertained the cause of their child's death, they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the course. They were inconsolable. Both died broken-hearted. Oh, God. Okay. Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized with a most violent fever and was often delirious. In these intervals, he would call upon Lord, Lord Ruthven and upon Yanthe. By some unaccountable combination, he seemed to beg his former companion to spare the being he loved. At other times, he would imprecate maledictions upon his head and curse him as her destroyer. Lord Ruthven chanced at this time to, chanced at this time to arrive at Athens, and, from whatever motive, upon hearing of the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled at the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. But Lord Ruthven, by his kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared that apathetic, he no longer appeared that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey. But as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired into the same state of mind, and Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him. 
During the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Ruthven was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cooling breeze, or in marking the progress of those orbs, circling, like our world, the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes <coughs> sorry. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Aubrey's mind by this shock was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit which had once so ex Oh, gosh, sorry. Aubrey's mind, by this shock, was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit, which had once so distinguished him, now seemed to have fled forever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Ruthven. But much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighborhood of Athens. If he sought it amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ganthe's form stood by his side, if he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood in quest of the modest violet. Then, suddenly turning round, would show, to his wild imagination, her pale face and wounded throat, with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly scenes, he determined to fly scenes, every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He proposed to Lord Ruthven to who he held himself bound by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece ne neither had yet seen. They traveled in every direction and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed, uh, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to slight these reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals, whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended dangers. In consequence of thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they traveled only with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as a defense. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile, at the bottom of which was the bed of a torrent, with large masses of rock brought down from the neighboring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence. For scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads, and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant their guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, had begun to fire in the direction whence the report came. Lord Ruthven and Aubrey, imitating their example, retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile. But ashamed of being thus detained by a foe, who, with insulting shouts, bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter, if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Ruthven received a shot in the shoulder, which brought him to the ground. Aubrey hastened to his assistance, and, no longer heeding the contest uh, or his own peril, was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him his guards having, upon Lord Ruthven's being wound wounded, immediately thrown up their arms and surrendered. By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighboring cabin, and having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence, they being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrade should return with the promised sum, for which he had an order. Lord Ruthven's strength rapidly decreased. In two days, mortification ensued, and death seemed advancing with hasty steps. His conduct and appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects about him. But towards the close of the last evening, his mind became apparently uneasy, and his eye often fixed upon Aubrey, who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness. Assist me. You may save me. You may do more than that. I mean, not my life. I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day, but you may save my honor, your friend's honor. How, tell me how, I would do anything, replied Aubrey. I need but little, my life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole, but if you would conceal all you know of me, my honor were free from stain in the world's mouth, and if my death were unknown for some time in England, I, I, but life. What? Death were unknown for some time in England, but life. Okay, it shall not be known. Swear, cried the dying man, 
raising himself with exultant violence, swear by all your soul reveres, by all your nature fears, swear that, for a year and a day, you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen, or whatever you may see. His eyes seemed bursting from their sockets. Swear, I swear, said Aubrey. He sunk, laughing, upon his pillow and breathed no more. Interesting, and there's the um, connection between the Byron um, fragment. Okay, Ruffin's dead, potentially. Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose upon his mind, and he knew not why. When he remembered his oath, a cold shivering came over him, as if from the presentiment of something horrible awaiting him. Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse, when a robber met him and informed him that it was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his retiring to the pinnacle of a neighboring mount, according to a promise they had given his lordship, that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death. Aubrey, astonished and taking several of the men, determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes, though the robbers swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had laid the body. For a time his mind was bewildered in conjectures, but he at last returned, convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes. Weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes, and in which all apparently conspired to heighten that superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it, and soon arrived at Smyrna. While waiting for a vessel to convey him to Otranto, or to Naples, he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to Lord Ruthven. Amongst other things, there was a case containing several weapons of offense, more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim. There were several daggers and adagans. Hello, hello! <sighs> thank you, Kylop 18... 16! For the follow! Uh, thank you for putting up with me. I hope you're enjoying the vampire! Uh, by John Polidori. So Lord Ruthman is dead-ish. Potentially. Um, there were several daggers and atagans. Atagans? Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, what was his surprise at finding a sheath apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He shuddered, hastening to gain further proof. He found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped, the sheath he held in his hand. You're loving it? Good! It's the spooky time, so... It is. It's proper time for it. So thank you, thank you. Glad you're here. Happy to have you. Um, yes, that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped, the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, yet still he wished to disbelieve. But the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and sheath, were alike in splendor on both, and left no room for doubt. There were also drops of blood on each. He left Smyrna. Oh, I gotta bring this up. Sorry. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome, his first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive, act, seductive arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined, and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship. Aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors. He was afraid that this lady had fallen a victim to the destroyer of Yanthi. He became morose and silent, and his only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postillions. Ah, sorry. Postillions, as if he were going to save the life of someone he held dear. He arrived at Calais, a breeze which seemed obedient to his will, soon wafted him to the English shores and he hastened to the mansion of his fathers, and there, for a moment, appeared to lose, in the embraces and caresses of his sister, all memory of the past. If she before, by her infantine caresses, had gained his affection, 
Now that the woman began to appear, she was still more attaching as a companion. Uh-oh. <laughs> Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing room assembly. Miss, sorry. Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing room assemblies. There was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy charm about it, which did not seem to arise from misfortune, but from some feeling within, that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a brighter realm. Her step was not that light footing, which strays where'er, where'er a butterfly or a color may attract. It was sedate and pensive. When alone, her face was never brightened by the smile of joy, but when her brother breathed, breathed to her his affection, and would, in her presence, forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest, who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary. It seemed as if those eyes, that face, were then playing in the light of their own native sphere. She was yet only eighteen, and had not been presented to the world, it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed until her brother's return from the continent, when he might be her protector. It was now therefore resolved that the next drawing room, which was fast approaching, should be the epoch of her entry into the busy scene. Aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's, and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. He could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers, when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed, but he determined to... sacrifice his own comfort to the protection of his sister. They soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day, which had been announced as a drawing room. The crowd... Why is it called a drawing room? It is, is it because it draws crowds, or is it because people draw there? <laughs> I haven't thought about that. The crowd was excessive. A drawing room had not been held for a long time, although now it's an event. The crowd was excessive, a drawing room had not been held for a long time, and all, who, and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened thither. Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, heedless of all around him, engaged in the remembrance that the first time he had seen Lord Ruthven was in that very place, he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm, and a voice he recognized too well sounded in his ear, Remember your oath. He had hardly courage to turn, fearful of seeing a specter that would blast him, when he perceived, at a little distance, the same figure which had attracted his notice on this spot upon his first entry into society. He gazed till his limbs almost refusing to bear their weight, he was obliged he gazed till his limbs almost refusing to bear their weight, he was obliged to take the arm of a friend, and forcing a passage through the crowd, he threw himself into his carriage, and was driven home about your sister. He paced the room with hurried steps and fixed his hands upon his head, as if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain. Lord Ruthven again before him. Circumstances started up in dreadful array. The dagger, his oath. He roused himself. He could not believe it possible. The dead rise again. He thought his imagination had conjured up the image, his the image his mind was resting upon. It was impossible that it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society, for though he attempted to ask concerning Lord Ruthven, the name hung upon his lips, and he could not succeed in gaining information. He went a few nights after with his sister to the assembly of a near relation, leaving her under the protection... Oh, I guess it's not covered, but there, sorry. Uh, near relation. Leaving her under the protection of a matron, he retired into a recess, and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself, and entering another room, found his sister surrounded by several, apparently in earnest conversation. He attempted to pass and get near her, when one, whom he requested to move, turned around, turned round, and revealed to him those features he most abhorred. He sprang forward, seized, seized his sister's arm, and with hurried step forced her towards the door, forced her towards the street. At the door, he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords, and while he was engaged in passing them, he again heard that voice whisper close to him, 
remember your oath. He did not dare to turn, but hurrying his sister soon reached home. Uh-oh. <laughs> Aubrey, so Aubrey became almost distracted. If before his mind had been absorbed by one subject, how much more completely was it engrossed now that the certainty of the monsters living again pressed upon his thoughts? His sister's attentions were now unheeded, and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct. He only uttered a few words, and those terrified her. The more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this monster to roam, bearing ruin upon his breath, amidst all he held dear, and not avert its progress? His very sister might have been touched by him, but even if he were to break his oath and disclose his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch. But death, he remembered, had been already mocked. For days he remained in this state, shut up in his room. He saw no one, and, and ate only when his sister came, who, with eyes streaming with tears, besought him, for her sake, to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected, and he wandered, as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognized. At first he returned with the evening to the house, but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him. His sister, anxious for his safety, employed people to follow him, but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any, from thought. His conduct, however, suddenly changed. Struck with the idea that he left by his absence the whole of his friends, with a fiend amongst them, of whose presence they were unconscious, he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely, anxious to forewarn, in spite of his oath, all whom Lord Ruthven approached with intimacy. intimacy. But when he entered into a room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward shuddering so visible, that his sister was at last obliged to beg of him to abstain from seeking, for her sake, a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remonstrance proved unavailing, the guardians thought proper to interpose, and, fearing that his mind was becoming alienated, they thought it high time to resume again that trust which had been before imposed upon them by Aubrey's parents. Desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly, they engaged a, physi a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him. He hardly appeared to notice it, so completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber. There he would often lie for days, incapable of being roused. He had become emaciated, his eyes had attained a glassy luster. The only sign of affection and recollection remaining displaying, displayed itself upon the entry of his sister. Then he would sometimes start, and seizing her hands with looks that severely afflicted her, he would desire her not to touch him. Oh, do not touch him. If your love for me is aught, do not go near him. When, however, she inquired to whom he referred, his only answer was, true, true, and again, he s and again he sank into a state whence not even she could rouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as the year was passing, his incoherences became less frequent, and his mind threw off a portion of its gloom, whilst his guardians observed that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number and then smile. The time had nearly elapsed. Oops, I gotta bring it up. Sorry. Mm. The time had nearly elapsed when, upon the last day of the year, one of his guardians entering his room began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstance of Aubrey's being in so awful a situation when his sister was going next day to be married. Instantly, Aubrey's attention was attracted. He asked anxiously to whom. Glad of this mark of returning intellect, of which they feared he had been deprived, they mentioned the name of the Earl of Marsden. Thinking this was a young Earl whom he had met with in society, 
Aubrey seemed pleased and astonished them still more by his expressing his, atten his intention to be present at the nuptials and desiring to see his sister. They answered not, but in a few minutes his sister was with him. He was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her, of her lovely smile, for he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears, flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with all his wonted warmth, and to congratulate her upon her marriage with a person so distinguished for rank and every accomplishment, when he suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast. Opening it, what was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life? He seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it underfoot. Upon her asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband, he looked as if he did not understand her. Then seizing her hands and gazing on her with a frantic expression of countenance, he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster, for he, but he could not advance. It seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath. He turned suddenly round, thinking Lord Ruthven was near him, but saw no one. In the meantime, the guardians and physician, who had heard the whole, and thought this was but a return of his disorder, entered, and forcing him from Miss Aubrey, desired her to leave him. He fell upon his knees to them. He implored, he begged of them to delay but for one day. They, attributing this to the, the insanity they imagined, had taken possession of his mind, endeavored to pacify him, and retired. Lord Ruthven had called the morning after the drawing room, and had been refused with everyone else. When he heard of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself to be the cause of it, but when he learned that he was deemed insane, his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information. He hastened to the house of his former companion, and, by constant attendance, and the pretense of great affection for the brother and interest in for the brother and interest in his fate, he gradually won the ear of Miss Aubrey. Who could resist his power? His tongue had dangers and toils to recount, could speak of himself as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth, save with her to whom he addressed himself, could tell how, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation if it were merely that he might listen to her soothing accents. In fine, he knew so well how to use the serpent's art, or such was the will of fate, that he gained her affections. The title of the elder branch falling at length to him, he obtained an important embassy, which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state, which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey, when he was left by the physician and his guardians, attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for pen and paper. It was given him. He wrote a letter to his sister, conjuring her, as she valued her own happiness, her own honor, and the honor of those now in the grave, who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house, to delay but for a few hours that marriage on which he denounced the most heavy curses. The servants promised they would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of Miss Aubrey by what he considered the ravings of a maniac. Night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard, with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described, the notes of busy preparation. Morning came, and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear. Aubrey grew almost frantic. The curiosity of the servants at last overcame their vigilance, they gradually stole away, leaving him in the custody of an, of an helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity, with one bound was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment wh where all were nearly assembled. Lord Ruthven was the first to perceive him. He immediately approached, and taking his arm by force hurried him from the room, speechless with rage. When on the staircase, Lord Ruthven whispered in his ear, Remember your oath, and know, if not my bride today, your sister is dishonored. Women are frail. <laughs> so saying, he pushed him towards his attendants, who, roused by the old woman, had come in search of him. Aubrey could no longer support himself. His rage not finding vent had broken a blood vessel, and he was conveyed to bed. This was not mentioned to his sister, who was not present when he entered, 
as the physician was afraid of agitating her. The marriage was solemni solemni solemnized, 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 and the bride and bridegroom left London. Aubrey's weakness increased. The effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death. He desired his sister's guardians might be called, and when the midnight hour had struck, he related composedly what the reader had, has perused. He died immediately after. The guardians hastened to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived, it was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. Ooh, way to end it! <laughs> oh! It was. That was good. I did. I enjoyed that. And was that, was that like, uh, sort of, again, not a trope, but like, a sort, kind of, a sort of thing at the time, where they end it with a bod, exclamation point, vampire, yes! <laughs> oh, like, and I don't know. I do. I think it's probably supposed to be a lot more, ooh, um, like it's supposed to hit more horrifically than it does. It just kind of, it reminds me of like those like B movie posters where it's like, oh, the thing or whatever, or whatever it is with the exclamation point. And, oh, so dramatic sort of thing. But again, at the time before it had been, um, overdone, it, it was, it was like right at the end you are, you're thinking maybe she'll be able to at least her, at least she'll be able to be saved. And no, oops, shoot. Sorry. Um, yeah. And then he is, he's still out there. Oh, there's no, there's no happy ending in this. <laughs> yeah. It didn't age well. The ending that is, yeah. <laughs> but then again, that's the thing. Had that been like that, construction of an ending had that been something that had at the time was popular or so like it was fine at the time and or was this one of the first times or was this the first time probably not the first time but maybe i don't know first time that it had been done where it would have hit so yeah but that's why i give it i give it grace just because I have, I have had that experience, that stuff that I have read or watched um, way after it's time and after it's been overdone and everything. Y yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, like, it does, like, the, it does cartoonize it a little bit. But then again, the, the, car the cartoonizing could just be because of the um, proceeding. Um, what's been inspired by it. But like, yeah, it was. It was just, it was all very narrative and deep and dark and all that. And then it just, melodrama right there at the end, that little peak of melodrama. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I'm not actually sure how much John Polidori actually wrote. Um... So, yeah, you mean its successors made it into a cliche. Right. So, like, we do. We, we might associate, or, like, at least I associate it with those, like, sort of faded, cartoony, um, again, yeah, like, B-movie posters where it's all melodramatic and it's got this and that. And I, I can't really describe it, but I hope you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Not just babbling incoherently. Um, but, like, yeah, so, like, at the time it at the time it would have been oh my gosh actually dramatic rather than the melodramatic rather than the theatrical um but yeah and 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 because like it was like the whole and i guess i don't know i don't i don't know whether it is objectively um this way or if it is just my own experiences from it it did. It did. I assume 
the intent was, because it what throughout it, it was like a, is Lord Ruthven vampire? Is he not? Is there a vampire? Yes, there is, but that whole sort of, it it doesn't. I don't know. It almost doesn't let it be solid, even though it kind of did. I'm not sure if I'm explaining this correctly. Um, and then right at the end, it just like, oh, it does the thing. Like, it is. It is him. And he is a vampire. And there is a vampire. And it just kind of right at the end. And maybe that is what it is. Like, there is absolutely no denouement from it. Is it just ends on the thing and it just kind of uh, leaves you a bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, vampires were abused to death since then. Exactly. I mean, even to this day, like you see in Twilight. Right. Yes, for us, it's predictable because we know all the tropes. Right. And so that's, that, so that's why I'm, I am, I'm trying to like kind of view it from an objective lens, except, I mean, you can't, you can't like fully do that. So again, just the fact that I, I do, I feel like that might be what it is where Like, one of the stories in Phantasmagoriana was, um, what, what, which one, what, I can't remember what it was called, but the, shoot, there was the, the woman who was in society or whatever, but she was kind of reclusive, but the one young, young woman clung to her, became, befriended her and everything, and there was this, it might have been called the storm. So then um, they were, there was a party and a storm broke out and everybody was going to stay for the night. But this um, more reclusive woman did not want to. She was not going to. She wanted to leave and go back home, but she couldn't do it. So she was going to go stay out in, um, out in the, in the outer room or whatever on a sofa and be fine with that. But then the, her younger friend, I think it was Emily. I'll go with Emily for now. Um, Emily was going to stay with her. So she's like, so, but the, the woman's like, no, no, we're not going to do that. And she's like, okay, fine. We'll go and stay in your room. They get there and she locks the door and is like, you brought this upon yourself stuff is going to happen tonight. You're going to be horrified. You're not going to tell anybody about it until I die. And it never actually said what those horrors were, but Emily went into a state. The next morning, the um, reclusive woman went home and Emily died without um, saying what had happened. And then later that the reclusive woman died as well. So, like, it is, is you got that that climax of the what was it, or you didn't quite get it. You kind of got it, but you didn't quite get it. That climax of something happened in the night, and then there was the denouement of, yeah, the aftermath of it. And it kind of, it added something to it. Whereas, like, with this one, it's just, like, I, th I do. I think it's, like, trying to save all of that for the end and do the, uh, symbol clash right there at the end just kind of doesn't work a little bit. I don't know. You do think that he made it obvious that Rothbat, okay, hang on, was a vampire, but he only says it explicitly right at the end. Right, and that and that's why. Like, it, it's almost, it, and I don't know if this is going to come out right, but it almost seems a little bit amateur. <laughs> again, again, I don't know. I don't know. But like just that whole, that thought of, ooh, I'm going to hit him right at the end sort of thing. You know what I mean? I think even the readers of the time would have understood that he was a vampire at some point, maybe when he dies in Greece. Right. And uh, yeah. And, and that's why I do. I am, I am somewhat curious about whether uh, Polidori actually did write anything else. Um, Cause like, again, Lord Byron was, writer um but like i don't i don't know i don't know if polidori was either because like it, it looking back on it and like with the ending again it does it seems like a little bit clumsy it was it was really good but that's the thing that because 
even back then, I would say, and, and I could be wrong, back then, even if you were an amateur writer, you, you would write better <laughs> than people write today because um, you had better um, uh, inspiration to draw from, if that makes sense. D does that, and is that, is that pretentious? I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, because it, I don't know, and I could just be talking out of my, hmm, at the moment, but that, again, that's just kind of what I'm getting from it, I guess. We say it's clumsy, okay, but to be fair, the people of the time were so impressed that they started making more and more copycat stories. Right, and that's what I'm saying is it, it's it's not. It's not a bad story or anything. A and that's why trying to take it in the context of the time um, and giving it that grace and being the first to have done these things, um, that is, there's a lot of credit to give there. So, and, and, and again, yeah, like I am, I'm, and, and again, and that's, and that's why I say like, I do, I'm not sure whether he wrote beyond this because it was really good. I really enjoyed it. The whole thing, even, even with the little ending there, it was, it, it, it was good. It was a different sort of enjoyment right at the end there. But so, so yeah, I would be, uh, and I don't, I don't want to, um, What's the word? Give it like a sound like I'm giving it a, like a a pity like pity points or anything because it's not it's like that oh he was an amateur but he was a good amateur sort of thing no it just there is there is a distinction between amateur writing nowadays and amateur writing back then I would say. Apparently he wrote some poems. Okay, and two plays. And another short novella. Okay, sounds good. But I guess maybe that's also, like, why... Not that... And again, not saying that, like, who I have heard of, if if I haven't heard of them, they're not good or anything. But, like, maybe that's why he's not necessarily, potentially, maybe, as well-known. <laughs> and maybe I'm just way out of the loop. Um, but... Like, yeah, because it was. It was one of those things where there was so much good there. And then there was just, like, that that little hiccup, if we can say. But again, at the time, maybe it wasn't. And it's just like a looking back on it. It's, like, just an interesting study, I guess. And he committed suicide at age 25. Well, damn. Dang, he wrote this before he was 25, though? <sighs> yeah. Sad, though. Because he was really young when he wrote this. Right! And, oh, and so that's the thing, too. So it is. It's. It might. It, it might not be, like, like amateurishness. It might just be that vigor of youth, maybe, where it's like... Because I do. I remember when I was, I mean, granted, much younger when I would try to write something and it would sound really cool in my head and then it would get out on the paper and it's like, no, that doesn't come across at all and it just sounds stupid. <laughs> so, but like, and again, not saying this sounds stupid, but like it comes off differently and again, probably based on the time and the content context, like it comes off a little bit differently than what might have been in his mind. So, yeah. Dang, though. <sighs> it was. I did. I really enjoyed it. I'm really happy with how spoopy reading went this year. Yeah, it was. It was good. I quite enjoyed that. And yeah, that's that's going to be it for Spoop Vember reading. Or Spoop Vember. Wow. It's getting... <laughs> I need the weekend. <laughs> I need to be done with tomorrow and just have the weekend. Spooptober. Spooptober reading the... Yeah. It was. It was super good. I'm really glad that it worked out this way because, yeah, I remember... Yeah, at least last year. I can't even remember the year before. But some of the ones that... 
some of the ones we tried it just it didn't it didn't work out very well but these were these these were pretty good I quite enjoyed that <sighs> so yeah I mean I have no more <laughs> um, and I do I will have to get to bed pretty soon um I kind of want to hang on let me let me get the thing up Da -da -da -da. Um, I kind of want to see how long Dracula actually is. Mm -hmm. Ah. Dang it. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll have to find out come next October. <laughs> Whether we can start getting the full-on books in at some point. Because at some point we're going to run out of proper scary, spooky short stories. Um, so, yeah. That'll be interesting. Because I would. I would love to see how the Dracula now compares to um, this one. And then and then Frankenstein we got to do at some point because that goes with it too. But, yeah. So, good night, good night. Um, I'll go over my thing. So, on... On Sunday, we'll be doing, um, uh, yeah, so that was, that was, um, the other, other works that came out of the same contest that Frankenstein came out of after having read the inspiration Phantasmagoriana Tales of the Dead from which that contest, uh, came out. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was that. I, I am, I'm pleased with that. Thanks for being here for for the finale of it. I did. I really enjoyed this um, this year's one. So uh, next, uh, so yes. Yeah, so then Sunday we do games. Um, kind of want to do like an actual like horror scary one, but I also have a sort of just kind of a cutesy one that I also kind of want to do. That's more Halloweeny to really get in the Halloweeny spirit and not just horror. Uh, but we'll see. So it's kind of up in the air at the moment. Tuesday we'll be get, getting back into flying, um, and yeah, I think we will potentially be doing that sim, so I'll practice my horrible ATC calls, or at least being a baby and having to practice things 12 times before I actually click the button. Um, yeah, so that's the plan, and then we'll figure out where we go from here, I guess. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it. So so this story was adapted into a bootleg French version and then turned into a play. What? Interesting. See, that's so cool because the Phantasmagoriana that they that inspired the contest was in French when they read it, and it was translated from German. So, but like it was, so like they read it in French and then they had a bootleg version that was translated back into French. So it all comes back to the French. <laughs> awesome. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's so cool. I do. And I do, I love how, like the creation, I love hearing about how these things come together and then their influence into further stuff because it is. It's just so interesting, the workings and, like, the ones and zeros of creativity, kind of, if that makes sense. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then, yeah, finishing up, um, yeah, I did. I had a, um, I had a day yesterday, which we'll probably talk about on Tuesday, because it was flying, and then, um, tomorrow I have another, uh, aviation-related thing that I have to do as well, trying to get that done. So, yeah, we'll probably get into that then. <laughs> so, yeah. Ah, so, yes, again, that was uh, Lord Byron's stuff. Uh, Lord Byron, Darkness, and a fragment of a novel by Lord Byron, and The Vampire by John Polidori. As finale for Spooptober reading, and, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> If 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 I did, if I if I miss missed anything else, I apologize. Brain as always is mush at the end of these things. Um, but again, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. To whoever got lost and found their way here somehow. <laughs> Hello, thanks for being here. <laughs> um, or found their way back. It was really good to chat with you again. And again, I hope things are going well and do continue to go well or start going well, whatever it is. Hope it's well. Um, and yeah, have a great whatever it's going to be for you. Have a great Halloween. Although I guess I will potentially, yeah, I will be on, on Sunday so I can say that again. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoyed. I did. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> so again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And 